My journey now takes me to Adelaide to former Telstra Business of the Year winner, Red Arc. I'm taking a different tack regarding my electrical setup of the Everest when compared to my Ranger. But if you ever wanted 12 volt advice, Red Arc is a good place to start. But before I get into the nitty gritty of my Everest installation, I thought I'd learn a little more about Red Arc. And who better to ask than the big kahuna, the top dog, Anthony Kittle, who has steered the company to some incredible success. So Anthony, what do you think really put Red Arc on the map when it comes to the four wheel drive touring market? Oh, look, I reckon it goes back to about 2002, Pat, when we designed our humble battery isolator, the smart battery isolator. I think that was the, the, the first product that really got us out in front of the consumer. And what sort of growth have we seen in the company over the years? Uh, on average, about 20% per annum. Wow. And, and that, that sort of number correlates with the fact that we invest 15 cents in every dollar back into R&D. So, you know, we put that much investment back into research and development uh, and we see that sort of growth number on top. Right, right. So what sort of number of employees are we actually talking about here at Red Arc? Oh, if I cast my mind back, you know, into the late 90s, we are eight staff. Today, we're about 388 staff. So, uh, you know, the numbers have, have grown significantly. Wow, wow. Now, one thing that blows me away with Red Arc is that you keep on bringing out new products, whether it's lithium battery, electronic brake controllers with the Tow Pro, battery management systems, go blocks. Every single product seems to smash it. What's the secret sauce, mate? Uh, look, I think it starts with the customer and understanding the customer's problem and I guess making life easier for people that want to go traveling. So it's that research that we do out in the field. And then secondly, it's the research that we do at the desk here in terms of developing new technology, getting our really smart people, our engineers, uh, in there to look at, well, how can we do this differently? What's going to elevate us uh, to, to a new level? And so it's, you know, trying out new technology. Uh, you know, we've got 90 engineers working on new ideas, new products. So if you think about all that intellectual horsepower, uh, we, we're solving really hard problems. And, and that's why the product, when it comes out the door, it's high quality, it's really rugged, it's been tested to the nth degree. Uh, hopefully it's the best on the market. What do you say to people that, that think, you know, Australia can't manufacture or design and engineer, you know, great product? Uh, well, hopefully there's not too many people that say that after COVID, because I think we've seen through the last couple of years that actually manufacturing in Australia is so important to our economy and so important to creating jobs in this country. So, you know, my view would be that um, we've got to do the research. We've got to start at that fundamental base research level, then into development, then into testing, prototyping, and we can do that better than anyone. So we've got you know, great universities. We can train people really well. Uh, and what I say to our people is, we don't want to be the lowest cost producer because that's a race to the bottom. But what we want to be is, is a company that's got the smartest people. Because if we've got the smartest people, we implement the smartest ideas, we're going to be the best company. You know, as new technology becomes available, you know, automation of electronics, for instance, use of cobots, the technologies that we employ is at cutting edge. And so, you know, we've got to have a really modern facility and, and, and obviously as we get bigger, that means more, more of it and uh, faster machines and, and better quality. But, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to really see that here in South Australia and in Australia as a whole. Absolutely, mate. When are you publicly listing? I want to, I want to buy some shares. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Anthony steers me into a strange and wonderful room. Actually, not a room at all, but a semi-anechoic chamber a place completely devoid of electrical interference and used to test product. So Anthony, what do you put it down to that Australia is really leading the charge in terms of engineering products for, for four-wheel drive touring? Well, I think if you look at the industry, you know, the four-wheel drive industry in Australia has been going, you know, in a big way since the 70s. So we're really ahead of the game in terms of um, focusing on that particular segment. But then you think about our conditions in terms of the outback and the extremes that we, we face. So, you know, the temperature profiles that the products need to survive in, the vibration characteristics with, you know, with the sorts of roads that we deal with. So you put all that together and we can design products that, you know, just don't fail. And then you think about, well, if you're in the United States and you're into overlanding, uh, why wouldn't you want to buy an Australian product? And so you think about the companies that that have prospered out of that, you know, with ARB, with Rhino Rack, um, with Red Arc, and so you, the list goes on and on, Safari. Um, yeah, I think it, it's just such a great breeding ground for this industry, and we're able to take our products globally. 
And speaking of globally, um, where are you guys exporting to these days? I think the last count was around 36 countries that Red Arc products are, are sold into. And uh, our major markets obviously are North America and into Europe. But, uh, you know, South Africa, into the Middle East, uh, into, you know, parts of uh, extreme parts of the globe, into Iceland. Um, really, really harsh conditions, harsh environments. And people, you know, they, they rate the Australian outback. And if, if a product can survive that, it should be able to survive anywhere. Next up, it was time to talk Everest Power Systems with product boss Dylan Pinkart. He kicked off with the Red Arc Go Block, a portable power system with 100 amp hours of lithium grunt inside. It's got everything you need for you know all the connections that you need at the campsite. So we've got um, your Anderson output, we've got your USBs to charge, uh, we've got the Ciggy socket output as well for any of your devices, and also the fridge socket. You can charge it from AC mains. You can charge it from the Ciggy socket in your car or you can charge it obviously from the Anderson plug at the back here, which you can do via solar or via DC charging from the vehicle. But if you really want to set it up properly, uh, you've got to get the dock. So the power dock is a connect and restraint system. So all you do is pull the handle over and it'll connect these points down here. Uh, and you can have solar and vehicle connected at the same time and it'll take power from both obviously taking solar first. So, and I guess the nice thing about a product like this that isn't necessarily hardwired into your vehicle if you don't want to, it means that if you've got a, you know, a fleet vehicle with work or, or a vehicle that you don't know if you want to keep for longer than a year or two, um, this is something that you can just transport from car to car. Yeah, exactly. So it's minimal install. Uh, and you know you can take it down to the campsite with you as well uh, and you can also loan it to your mates if one of your mates is going away and he doesn't have a setup with his fridge and that kind of stuff um, so yeah it's perfect for that kind of thing and that's going to power my angle for days and days and days too so <laughs> yeah definitely but if you get the 100 amp hour version you you easily get um, a long weekend um, powering the fridge opening the fridge heaps of time to get your beers out um, but yeah, it'll definitely work longer than that if you need it to. So. Okay, and obviously fully compatible with the solar blanket. Um, uh, what size solar blanket would you recommend for that? This kind of uh, setup. Um, look, you could go definitely always overspec on the solar blanket. That that way you'll be getting more sun when or well, more solar power when the sun sun starts to go down. Um, but for this for this unit, you could you could easily plug a 300 watt blanket into it. So yeah, I'd recommend going going the big one, getting the most out of it, and getting the charge back into it as quick as you can. Fantastic! We'll throw one in the uh, back of the rig, mate. Sweet, perfect. With the power supply sorted, I'm going to need something to plug into it. So with that in mind, I headed to Bris Vegas to chat with an old mate of mine and complete fridge guru, Rick Signs. G'day, Rick. Great to see you, mate. You too, Pat. Mate, I've come here to your headquarters to try and learn a little bit more about the, the history of Engel. Where did things actually start for the Okay, company? in 1962, the first Engel portable fridge arrived in Australia, operated by the South Fiji Swing Motor. Right, okay, mate, and why so special? I mean, how does okay. it work? It has one moving part. It was purpose-built to be a true portable fridge compressor. It's run with rare earth magnets, okay, um, attracts and repels at 50 revolutions a second, with a little piston. And she's good to work on all sorts of different angles? Yeah, yeah, up, up to 30 degrees, okay. No drop in efficiency from your fridge, okay. And the lowest maximum current draw of any fridge compressor in the world, 12 volt fridge compressor. Isn't that incredible that you've got technology from 1962 that has essentially yet to be surpassed in terms of efficiency? Correct, yeah, yeah. We, we pride ourselves on the lowest maximum current draw, okay. So you're averaging somewhere around what, what three amps draw at maximum? Uh, How you maximum on your MTV45, for instance, and your smaller models, a maximum three amps. On the 60s and 80s, even the 75 Combi, 3.6. Right, okay. And how does that compare with other brands on, on the market? Okay, um, less than half wow. versus other right. brands in their maximum 12 volt draw. When it comes to the Australian market, just, you know, how, where, where, do, we, where do we sit on the world market? It's ridiculous the amount of fridges or portable fridges sold in Australia. Okay, our, our dealer network with consumers in Australia in two weeks purchase what the state's doing a year. Wow. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And does that flow through to product development? I mean, we're just little old Australia. This yeah. is a Japanese design. It, it, it does. The guide or the team at Engel Australia will invite some of our engineers from Japan to come out 
okay, throw them in the back of a vehicle, take them to Cape York, they dial in all their electronic data log equipment, and they're blown away on some of the G-force levels or ratings they get by driving our corrugator race. They're not just using the back of Forbes, are they? A lot of trucks and a lot of yeah. testing's done in that, that environment too, which yeah. is obviously pretty I think hard. too, because we've been here since 1962, we've become a big part of so many Australians. Again, like you said, besides just people being on holidays, um, the guys in the trucks, that's their livelihood. Okay, they want to be guaranteed they've got their food and drinks when they pull up of a night time. So yeah, the Engel history is a big part of Australia's culture. Yeah, yeah. Well, mate, I use these as part of my livelihood too, because <laughs> yeah, I'm, on, yeah, on, exactly. I'm on the road full time. So uh, I've got some new vehicle builds. Um, you know, is there anything new? We've got some technology from 1962 here that hasn't changed much. Is there anything new for me? There is something very new. Follow me this way, Pat. Done. So, Pat, secrets out. Okay, mate. Well, what are we looking at here? 60th anniversary, I can see, but what's what's new? Okay, so 2022, Engel celebrates 60 years in Australia, and as we've done previously with the gold 50th anniversary, a limited edition fridge to celebrate Engel 60 years in Australia. Fantastic, mate. Um, tell me you haven't changed too much. What, what are we running here? We still well, <laughs> we've got the body of the MTV 45, which is our most popular fridge. Okay, still operated by the South Fuji swing motor, but fridge is now operated via an app. Oh mate, there is a beer button on there. I'm happy already. <laughs> so what happened with the beer button? Oh, going back to the app, you dial in the temperature required. So your fridge temperature or dial it down to minus 18 for your freezer. If you hit the beer icon, automatically dials the fridge temperature to three degrees instantly. If you go into your fridge, leave the lid open, the fridge will turn from blue to red with the door open as an image. And then 15 seconds later, if you haven't closed the lid, you'll hear an alarm inside the fridge, which will beep to let you know, come back, shut the lid. So you're not wasting that precious 12 volt power. And uh, what else is on there, mate? Okay, your battery protection. Okay, so you can predetermine off if you've got a really good battery bank like yourself with all your lithiums. Um, so off in a dual battery system, or even on the low for a dual, and then through to mid and high. Okay, especially in a single battery operation, set it to high. That way you're not going to kill that battery under the bonnet. Right, yeah. What if someone says I'm allergic to apps, I don't necessarily like Like, them. like myself, <laughs> okay. If you're allergic to apps, come back your angle control panel. Uh -huh. Okay, so dial your temperature again up and down as required and set your battery protection as required. And I noticed it's got some fail safes there. So you've got, you've got a little lock button there. So that's going to, I'm guessing, stop if, if, if some of your load shifts and lands on your buttons. Yeah, correct. So once you've locked it again, you've locked in that temperature that you've predetermined. Okay. Yeah, okay, gotcha. And any other features on here, mate? Yeah, USB charging port for your phones, your iPad, similar products. You just need to get some charging. They, you said they're limited edition, obviously a brand new paint job there. Nice, uh, nice sort of pearly white um, exterior in the sticker pack, um, but limited, you're saying? Very, very limited. Okay, and again, like you said, reinforced, the colour is crystal pearl that celebrates an anniversary of 60 years. When we say limited, yeah, very, very skinny in the numbers. So for all our angle people in Australia, if you want something very special, get in and get it, because once they're sold, you'll never see it again. We know that people are sort of collectors of angle fridges too. They don't tend to <laughs> break, break down, that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, keep an eye on that, guys, because when they come out, they, they may land for you know, a matter of a month or so, and then they, they could all be gone. Yeah, similar to the 50th anniversary model, they went really well. Okay, everybody got in, got their limited edition 50th. But again, with the 60, yeah, numbers are really skinny. Mate, congratulations, mate. 60th anniversary in any business is not a bad thing. And it's pretty incredible that the technology from 60 years ago is still living today in that compressor. In that secret weapon. And again, that is our secret weapon, the South Fiji swing motor. Okay, we're very proud of, again, the information we give to you and give to everybody is very factual. Yeah, yeah. On those current draws. Gotcha. Well, mate, um, better unplug her and uh, get on the other side of this because I want this in the back of my truck. No worries, mate. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> well, my Outback Armour suspension has given me 40 millimetres of extra altitude, so what better way to fill in the guards than with a set of larger tyres? I went for a set of Cooper AT3 XLT tyres. I'm a big fan of this tyre for the application because not only are they super quiet on road, they're hard wearing too. 
I've gotten 80,000 Ks out of these in the past, so for a beach build that doubles as a daily driver, they're perfect. Oh, and the carcass construction is next level too, so if I get the urge to do the canning stock route, I won't need to change my tyres. I went for 33s in the Everest and mounted them to some KMC Grenade alloy wheels, which are a plus 35 offset. This works great because I don't have to worry about poke or the fitment of flares to keep her legal. Coming up next, I'll try and get some extra fuel range out of the Everest and I'll cook up a campfire lunch with my buddies from Bushwhacker. The last few pieces of the puzzle are coming together and you find me now in the village of Barnsley out the back of Newcastle with Rick Black, CEO of Long Ranger. So Rick, I know you and the family have been in the long range tank game for quite a while. How long has it actually been? Oh mate, look, I remember painting tanks uh, in high school, mate. I'd say, so we're going back to about late 70s, we've been building tanks, so long time. Wow, and, yeah. and how, did, how did the business actually kick off? Our weekends and our holidays always involved a road trip, uh, whether that be the Barrington Tops or out west. When you're adventurous, you find yourself, you just need more fuel. Uh, to get to the places you want to go and enjoy and find those little secret spots that we all want to find, you know. So that's, that's how it was born, basically. Okay, so you decided build bigger tanks for yourselves and then, and then that turned itself into a business? Absolutely, mate. Well, look, surprisingly, uh, it actually started as a backyard business all them years ago. Dad uh, built a 40 by 40 shed in the backyard and started building stuff for himself. And, and before you know it, um, being involved in the local Land Rover Club back in the day, um, you then start to get mates asking you, can you build me one of these? And it all spawned from, um, from just helping fellow travellers out, your, your local friends and, and mates. And, uh, and before you know it, you think, well, hey, this is a great idea. We, we need to get onto this. Geez, you've made a few tanks in the meantime. <laughs> uh, thousands of tanks, mate. So uh, we're actually getting up, uh, our part numbers are getting up into triple digits. And, uh, and the, there's, yeah, there's well in excess of 100,000 tanks floating around the world somewhere, mate. Is so that right? It's, wow. Yeah, pretty wow. awesome, mate. Yeah. And you export them as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely, mate. All, all around the world, uh, some big countries of the Middle East, uh, Africa, uh, a little bit to Europe and the States as well. So um, uh, I think Australia is pretty well renowned for our four-wheel drive accessories in the aftermarket game. And, uh, and yeah, so we're, we're well sought after for a lot of those places, mate. We've got our Everest um, mock-up tank here, I suppose. What, what, are we, what are we looking at here? Yeah, yeah, this is the Everest tank, mate. It looks like something from Star Wars, I think. But um, this model, it's looking like it's going to be around the 125 litre mark. And, um, you know, we've got places for our rollover valves and we've got our fuel pump will go in here. We've got some brackets on the side and we've got all these fancy shapes because we're going up in around the floor pan uh, and suspension components to make the, get the maximum capacity we can to, to get this uh, Everest to all your next adventures. Excellent, mate. That's going to give me a massive amount of extra range. Yeah. So what, what are, what's the actual construction? Uh, what, what are we made out of here? Two mil aluminized steel is, is a, the main base for our construction. Uh, we have some machined rings up here that accept the O-rings and, and that from the OE parts that we transfer from the original tank to this one. And then we've got lots of design elements. We've got these folds in it to give us shape and clearance on, on all the different components that, that are up underneath the floor. We've got some things, you can see some baffle marks here that uh, where our baffles are welded to help stop the fuel slushing around because when you're uh, uh, getting low on fuel, you want to retain that fuel around your, your pickup unit. Um, plus our brackets, you can see we've got some, we design our brackets with um, uh, pads behind them and some extra material around it to help with fatigue and stuff and to, to make sure that they're structurally sound. Okay, now there's a few tanks going to, to um, poly these days. What, what do you think the advantage is to, to use this construction instead? Uh, look, one of the, the main advantages is um, uh, things like, and sometimes it can be the simple things, that, things like a drain plug. Um, it's amazing how many people are misfueling cars, whether you drive a diesel for work and a petrol at home or the other way around or a truck or whatever. And you've got to think twice when you're filling up a servo. It's amazing. So just being able to simply drain the fuel out if you've misfueled it or you've got a bad batch of fuel out west, uh, it, it turns a, a, what could be a very hard job into a very simple job. Not only that, we're, uh, we're more flexible in our design. Uh, not having to invest heavily in the moulding and the tooling to, to rotor mould plastic. Um, we can uh, come up with lots of little design features that, that add to the capacity or the ground clearance. 
um, and baffles are a big thing as well. Uh, for us, we uh, think they're important to the uh, integral strength of the tank. And uh, because we're going a bit bigger, we've got that fuel slushing around inside a bigger vessel. So it helped keep the, uh, the fuel around your pickup point, which is really important when you want to use every last litre of your fuel tank. Okay, Matt, so we've got the, she's stitched up now. What's the next process in terms of getting this up uh, inside? Yeah, so this is um, our first uh, mock-up or prototype, if you like. So we, we borrowed your car a few weeks ago and we digitised and scanned all of the car underneath. And this is our first attempt. So the boys have tacked it all up ready to go in. And um, we've come here today, so we're going to, uh, we'll get that factory fuel tank out and then we're gonna put this up there. We'll make sure we've got all of our good clearances on everything. We'll check out the, 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 the ramp over angle. So we wanna make sure that you've got, still got good off-road performance um, and, uh, and make sure that we've, it's gonna fit everywhere. And if we have to make any adjustments, we'll do that. We can do that on the CAD relatively easy uh, and, and knock up another one if need be. Um, but it's mainly just checking all those little detail areas to make sure it's gonna fit great uh, and, um, and miss all of the, the vital things like brake lines and suspension components, uh, tail shaft clearances, all those sorts of things. Make sure we've, we've got all of that down pat, yeah. Fantastic, well mate, I'd better uh, let you get into it and uh, throw her up there so I can get some extra range. Good stuff, thanks, thanks mate. I bounced back up to the Gold Coast to visit the Bushwhacker team and discuss my 180 degree awning. I went for that one rather than their 270 degree awning so it wouldn't foul with the lifting tailgate on the Everest. Now the last time I was up here they cooked me the most delicious lunch. So I twisted their arm to show you how it's done. Okay so we're out the front of Bushwhacker now and now we've dragged in Don the Saffa Super Chef to show us uh, how these, now what are they called actually? Because to an Aussie they'd be called a toasted sanger, yeah. but uh, what do you guys call them? So traditionally they're called a bray brookies, which is effectively bray being barbecue, brookie being bread, so effectively a, bri a barbecue toasting. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, let's get into it, mate. How, show me how it's done. All right, so pretty straightforward and simple. Um, you take your white bread preferably, uh, but again, you can use sourdough, anything to those de degrees. You butter both sides, um, you face down there, um, and then you apply from um, the inside. So oh, I normally do it like that, and then we'll flip them over. That butter on the outside allows it to go a bit of a golden brown and also stops that burning just on the edges as well. So then we just build them up with a bit of tomato um, and onion. Onion, you don't want to uh, uh, cut it too small. Um, so preferably in a bit of rings. Um, and you just put them on there. That's really a lot of the taste and everything comes from, from the onions themselves. Yeah, okay, and raw onions, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. So nice raw onions gets that flavor running right through. Um, and then two slices of cheese, pepper, and salt. And then the secret is Mrs. Bull's. Mrs. Bull's chutney, um, very age old. South African tradition. Um, I would hesitate to say how old it is, but pretty much a staple in the South African cupboards, um, in your campers, everything else like that. Um, just just a go-to product for everything that we have. It just adds a bit of a sweetness to it, um, and really great. So that just a good bit of that on the top, and then. We spread them around. Excellent. And folks, he's not kidding about that chutney. Um, when I was up here last time, the, the first shop that I went to straight after was to go and track this stuff down. <laughs> you can find it in supermarkets, South African specialty stores, but um, it, is, uh, it is special stuff. It's amazing, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, so we get that from our local Springbok Foods, and then it goes into one of our roasters. So with the recipe sorted, it was all hands on deck to load up the roaster. Don tells me that the trick is to cook slow, allowing the cheese to melt inside but not burn the outside. The general uh, principle being you have to have beer when you cook them. Um, in a standard staple in any South African barbecue. Um, general principle, two sips of beer while you're having a chat, flip it over. <laughs> Excellent, I love it. I love the timer mate, very good, very good. Okay, so low heat and, uh, and don't burn. Last two sips of the beer and we're ready to go. That looks like perfection. It looks amazing, mate. Look at that. Put that out. Perfect. And off 
Yeah. Look Perfect. at that. That looks awesome. Good job. Cool. Oh, That's thank yours. you, Annalise. Yeah. Right, cheers. Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 <laughs> Delicious. Yeah. So good. So good. That is beautiful, guys. It gets the it gets the flavours from the from the fire, from the wood, from the chutney, the onion. It's just this perfect combination. And you, you know, people might be thinking, "Oh, that's a really that's just a toasted sanger." It's not. It is actually really something different. It's certainly different to any toasted sanger that you would have at home. <laughs> yeah, and so it really brings out all the flavours in it um, and it all amalgamates together. So, so, so good. Mm, thank you, There's guys. This is awesome. Yes. Still to come, we put the finishing touches on Project Everest and unleash it on the sand. The Everest was really coming together now. The Rhino Rack team wove their magic to install a backbone system and a Pioneer platform. This being the very first in the world installed on a next-gen Everest. And once that was on, the shovel holder was mounted along with the exit tracks and of course the Bushwhacker Extreme 180 awning. The Oz Off-Road team mounted up the Uniden 5 watt unit and aerial along with the adjustable Nighthawk VLI driving lights. These flamethrowers have incredible distance, but they also have a dial so you can adjust them to suit your driving. Perfect if you're in an area with reflective signs or fog, where standard lights aren't enough, but full output lights are too much. Next up, we slipped on the Aussie made four element seat covers from Black Duck. They're soft on the tush, but fully waterproof. So these seats on the Everest will look new underneath no matter where we go. The EVCX throttle controller by Ultimate 9 was also connected. And boy, doesn't this change the driving feel. With economy, power, and even a launch mode, it's a bucket of fun to play with. The level of adjustment in the latest model is something else. And for a few hundred bucks, it's one of the best bang for your buck accessories you can buy. Sometimes, when you build a 4x4, it becomes more, much more, than the sum of its parts. But let's face it, you never really know how it's going to turn out. I mean, you have an idea, but get a few details wrong, the colour of a bull bar, the setup of the storage system, and it might not be exactly what you wanted. But not this time. I am beyond thrilled with how this next-gen Everest turned out. Every single thing I've bolted on just adds to an already capable and great-looking 4x4. From the bull bar to the wheel and tyre combo to the Rhino rack and the long-range tank and storage system, it's supremely functional and capable. Now, it wasn't cheap and you're looking at over 50 grand's worth of mods here, so I've definitely informed Club 4x4 to cover all of these mods on the insurance policy. But is it worth it? abso freaking lootly And the christening run across Australia proved just how worth it. From towing trailers around the Blue Mountains, to tackling the beaches of South Oz, to the biggest sand dunes in Western Australia, the Everest wasn't just capable, it was comfortable. Comfortable to camp out of, to eat out of, and even pretty handy once the traction ran out. But all of those adventures are still to come in our season, so keep an eye out for the rest of our 15th anniversary adventures. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, but we did have to cut more than half an hour out of this episode to fit it into the TV time slot. So jump onto the Mr. 4x4 app to watch the extended version of the Project Everest build. I'm Pat Callanan, and until next time, keep the shiny side up. When the fight comes knocking at our door, where do we hide? When the change is